Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Electa India and our host, Dr. Manjul Tripathi, I welcome you to the webinar on the value of Lexil Gamma Knife Radio Surgery for EBM. Dr. Manjul is currently the faculty for neurosurgery at the Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education Research, Chandigarh. Prior to his current assignment, he was a faculty at Nimhans, Bangalore. He has authored 110 research papers and is a recipient of several awards for his outstanding contribution to the field. He has been a fellow for functional neurosurgery at Oxford and has mastered his skills training from Ames, New Delhi. His areas of interest span functional neurosurgery, gamma knife radiosurgery, neurotrauma, skull-based neurosurgery, and like a true clinician, art and science of injuries. Before Dr. Manjul starts, two basic ground rules for the smooth execution of this webinar. All attendees would be on mute to ensure that there is no hindrances, hindrance to the flow of the webinar. And secondly, for any questions that you may have, please type it under the questions tab on the webinar control panel. Dr. Manjul would address them towards the end of his session. So without further ado, I hand over to Dr. Manjul. Thank you for this introduction. Very good afternoon and I welcome you all for this webinar on the role of gamma knife radiosurgery in the management of various intracranial artery venous malformations. Being a microvascular neurosurgeon and radiosurgeon, I find myself in a balanced position to deal with this fascinating and sometimes frustrating disorder. I do not have any financial disclosure and the contents of this webinar are strictly for the educational purposes. So the word radiosurgery needs some attention as there are several misconceptions related to it. There are several techniques of radiosurgery which demand their special mention and it includes Lexel gamma knife radiosurgery, robotic radiosurgery, LENAC radiosurgery, etc. In this talk, I limit myself to my experience with gamma knife radiosurgery. It is named so as it is gamma rays which are emitted by 192 sources of cobalt 60 knife because it has a competitive and supplemental role to microneurosurgery and radiosurgery as it is a radiation tool essentially used by the neurosurgeons once the decision has been finalized for gamma knife radiosurgery the patient is asked to report in the gamma suit early in the morning so we are discussing now how do we do the procedure if you are practicing on the earlier generation gamma knife machine before that uh, before the latest icon machine which is a frameless machine you need to fix a lexel g frame over the patient's head while with icon you can practice the frameless stereotaxy with similar accuracy and precision as that of the frame based technology following this digital subtraction angiography and magnetic resonance imaging are performed I believe in evaluating the AVM on these two techniques as DSA provides a dynamic imaging which helps us in the exact definition of the nidus. Co-registering the DSA image with representative MRI helps in evaluating the organs at risk and confidence in the treatment planning. Once the images are acquired, the nidus and organs at risk are separately defined. It is always advisable to identify and mark the draining vein as it remains at a risk of occlusion if not taken care of. Once the plan is finalized, the patient is shifted to the gamma gantry and the treatment is performed. The frame is removed after the completion of the treatment and the patient can be discharged home. So what do you mean by a radiosurgery? The gamma knife radiosurgery is administration through the intact skull of a unique and high dose of ionizing radiation to practically any intracranial location. As a concept, this was first envisioned by Professor Lars Lexel in the last century. He and his colleague, Dr. Steiner, could treat the first patient of intracranial AVM in 1970. Traditionally, gamma knife radiosurgery is a single fraction treatment. But now, with the updates in the technique, it is acceptable to do the treatment in one to five fractions, which can be needed in patients with the large volume and complex lesions. To maintain a safety and complication profile, it is always desired to give radiation only to the target while sparing the normal brain parenchyma. In stereotactic radiosurgery, we give very high dose of radiation to the nidus while sparing the arteries and draining veins. We desire a sharp dose fallout and steep gradient. 
as you can see in my handwritten uh, hand drawn uh, diagram if the tumor is a small it becomes easy to achieve this goal with minimal radiation spillage to the surrounding organ set risk and the organ set risk may differ as per the location of the target if the same volume increases in size you need to use a staged radio surgery or downstage your target from a large to a small volume that we will discuss when we will discuss the large volume and complex avm in our in our this talk my this talk is based on my experience with nearly 500 patients of avm at two different machines the uh, lexel 4c and the perfection at two different institutes in india out of these i have treated nearly 50 patients of complex and large volume avm with different fractionation schemes either dose fractionation or the volume fractionation in the opd when we sit in the outpatient we get patients with or without bleed with or without neurological deficits sometimes even on incidental detection most of the times these patients have already consulted many doctors and they themselves seem perplexed because of the variety of opinions they receive some consultants just advise to wait others ask them to get it excised some want to embolize and some send them for radio surgery ironically all declare that they manage an avm but none actually guarantees that they can take care of the disease with minimum complications and hardly anyone boasts of a cure hence in the coming slides we will be discussing the different facets of avm and their radiosurgical management with the comparative evaluation of the other contemporary techniques in my this talk i would mostly concentrate on the radiosurgical management the important things to decide is whether we are definitely wise and medical legally sure to answer all the queries related to the avm till now there is no epidemiological study to confirm the true incidence and prevalence of an avm as it is very variable in the different ethnic populations it is second only to aneurysm among other intracranial lesions that produce a subarachnoid hemorrhage its annual detection rate is 1.34 per 100,000 person years and nearly half of them present with an intracranial bleed 30% are usually complex or large in size very rarely they may have a syndromic or a familial presentation the common presenting modes are intracranial bleed seizures headache or the neurological deficits secondary to the steel phenomena of an avm so there have been multiple articles dealing with the natural history of ruptured and unruptured avm separately as a consensus the annual bleed rate is six percent per year followed by 4.5 percent per year in the majority of the patients the mortality rate is one percent per year while the combined morbidity and mortality profile is nearly two to three percent per year but when you discuss these data with the patient you also need to consider the age of the patient and the angio architecture of the avm as avm is a dynamic disorder it keeps changing in its appearance the annual hemorrhage risk of an avm is actually a single point in the natural history of the disease which needs to be compounded with the prospective risk of progressive neurological disorders deficits psychological burden and stroke risk hence when you decide that management option you also need to take care uh, you need to consider the age and the presentation of the patient the major discussion surfaced when aruba got published this prospective study actually compared the natural history of an avm with an intervention and surprisingly they found that actually observing an unruptured avm was a wiser decision than any kind of intervention whether surgery embolization or radio surgery as soon as it got published it garnered more controversy than solid conclusions because the critical evaluation of the aruba found the flaws in the study design the aruba group had a follow-up period of 33 months which was very less looking at the chronicity and the long-term natural history of the disease and overall they had poor representation of the other treatment modalities especially the radiation therapies because they compared all kind of the radiation tools in a blanket cover which was not a right choice for the comparison so among the major criticism the one by radio surgery group was that there was no information on the obliteration rate the results were only on the short term basis 
while we consider the latency period of 30, 36 months with any radio surgery tool. They reported erroneously high complication profile up to the range of nearly 31% with intervention, which was later on refuted when we had a retrospective and prospective evaluation of the Aruba eligible patients. So now looking back at Aruba, we find that this study only emphasized the point that radio surgery may not be beneficial during the latency period of three years. So in conclusion, we can say that Aruba does not add to our knowledge about radio surgery and it cannot be utilized to counsel the patients about radiosurgical option. After the publication of Aruba trial, multiple centers tried to reevaluate their results of radio surgery in Aruba eligible patients with long term follow up. This study published in stroke in 2016 evaluated nearly 509 patients of Spetzer Martin grade 1 to 4 AVM with median 86 months follow up and found an impressive obliteration rate of 75%. More important than this was favorable outcome in nearly 70% of the patients. The permanent radiation induced injury, neurological deficits, and mortality were respectively 3, 5, and 4%. Interestingly, the revealed rate in the latency period was only 0.9% per year, which was way less than earlier estimations. So to summarize, radio surgery does provide durable clinical benefit to maximum of Aruba eligible patients, as it is not possible to find a non-intervention natural history of these patients now in the era of the cafeteria choices. It is rather advisable to actually maintain a registry of these patients, so we should gain more insight about the behavior of this disease in the coming two decades. On my own critical evaluation of the published literature after the publication of Aruba, I could find that telling an annual risk of only 4% is like giving a false sense of security to the patient. Centers which do not deal with those many cases often state that annual hemorrhage rate for an AVM is 2 to 4% in, case, in cases of an unruptured AVM, while 6% in cases of a ruptured AVM. Actually, it may range from as low as 0.9% for a low grade AVM, for a low grade superficially located unruptured AVM with superficial drainage to as high as 34% for a previously ruptured deep seated AVM with a deep venous drainage and feeding artery aneurysm. So, to conclude, you need a keen eye and thoughtful evaluation of the NGO architecture of each and individual AVM to predict the outcome and risk with that case. If we, look at, if we look at the results of microneurosurgery, the leading series have reported morbidity in the range of 3 to 38 percent and mortality 0 to 4 percent. The cure rate has been reported even up to 100 percent in the selected group of AVM patients. On the other hand, radiosurgery has provided obliteration in 69 to 100 percent of the patients as per the patient population with much less morbidity and mortality complications than microneurosurgery and embolization techniques. So as a clinician, when are we justified in treating? We are definitely justified in offering a treatment to a patient who has earlier bled and the relative indications for the treatment are progressive neurological deterioration and the patients with documented steel phenomena leading to the neurological deterioration, which might be a melting brain syndrome or seizures or intractable headache. I personally have a love and hate relationship with this difficult disorder. As a doctor and as a patient, we have nearly same expectations with the treatment. We all want no nidus, no further bleed, good quality functional life, no drugs and no complications. In the coming slides, we would be knowing how does radio surgery help in achieving these goals, up to what extent and at what cost. We need to remember that when we are talking about AVM, we are discussing only the nidus. A nidus is a pathological bunch of vessels which lacks many regular features of an artery or a vein. For the ones not exposed to radio surgery at present, it is of utmost importance to understand that radio surgery is similar to a surgical strike in which you do focused attack only on the nidus, sparing the artery and the vein. The draining vein should be preserved as its early closure before the obliteration of nidus may actually increase the chances of bleed 
and inadvertent injury to the feeding artery may lead to collateral damage in the form of ischemic events. Radio surgery exposes pathological vascular endothelial growth factors and endothelia on its luminous luminal surface, which otherwise are scant in a normal vascular wall. The experimental studies on rats and autopsy studies have clearly shown that radiation leads to injury to the endothelial cells, smooth muscle proliferation, highland degeneration, and eventually obliteration of the lumen. Why does an aneurysm or a normal vasculature not show the similar reaction to radiation is an another matter of research and beyond the purview of the present talk. So when does it get obliterated after radio surgery? Obliteration of an AVM is actually a time and dose dependent phenomena. This point should be kept in mind, explained to the patient and carefully documented that the obliteration is going to take time and this time may vary from two years to five years, depending on every individual anatomy. If the dose is more than 20 gray, the AVM will show favorable response down the line of three to four years or earlier also. Traditionally, the latency period of three years should be considered. If you consider all the grades of AVM, the obliteration rate is roughly 70 to 75%. It is 90 to 100% for good grade AVM, that is grade 1 to 3, 68 to 70% for thalamic and brainstem AVM, and 30 to 40% for large volume and complex AVMs. The factors apart from those in time which determine the occlusion of an AVM are AVM nidus volume, its location, the treatment dose, coverage of AVM, and history of prior embolization. The next question arises in how much how much dose is too much dose is a very important factor in the radio surgery if the prescription dose is 16 gray the chances of long-term obliteration are only 70 percent but if it is nearly 24 to 25 gray the chances of obliteration are very high in a small volume avm sometimes even up to the tune of 100 percent but whenever we increase the dose we increase the chances of obliteration and simultaneously, there is the risk of radiation-induced complications. There is a narrow therapeutic window for the same, and in most of the cases, we remain safe in prescribing radiation dose of 22 to 24 gray at 50% isodose. Going beyond that actually does not improve the obliteration, but increases the chances of complications. The complication profile is also dependent on the location of an AVM. In radiosurgical practice, a very important criteria is the 12 gray volume of the brain. It means the volume of the brain which is receiving the 12 gray radiation. And ideally, it should be less than 10 cc for a single session radio surgery. As you can see in the graph, the chances of radiation induced complications are high, if the relatively high, if the AVM is located in the deeper structures of the brain, such as thalamus, basal ganglia, brain stem, etc rather than in the lobar or the superficial location. So your brain receiving 12 gray radiation should be less than 10 cc. From the radiosurgical perspective, the favorable factors are a smaller volume AVM, low flow, compact nidus, high prescription dose, longer follow-up, uh, the low grade AVM, such as the Martin grade 1 and 2, and the non eloquent location. The unfavorable factors are large size, associated aneurysm, fistulous connection, and the history of prior embolization. Another very important and frequently missed factor is the error in targeting. You need to mark your nidus very carefully. If you miss the target, you are bound to have residues and the complications with it. What imaging do you need to plan a radio surgery? It is always advisable to plan a radio surgery for AVM on both MRI and DSA. The DSA helps in exact definition of nidus as it is a dynamic imaging. Better identification of the draining vein and identification of associated anomalies. And the associated anomalies for which one should be very careful 
are, are flow related aneurysm, fistulous connections, proliferative angiopathy. It should be co registered with MRI. MRI especially helps in planning as it is a three dimensional image. It helps in the identification of organs at risk and calculation of the high risk volume. There have been many myths which I have noted on the screen and I would like to explain in the coming slides. The one which have been written here are actually the myths. They are not the reality. There have been several confusions about the site and size of an AVM and does it affect the risk of hemorrhage. There are only selected factors which count at high risk for AVM rupture. That is the deep venous drainage, single venous drainage, venous stenosis, intranital aneurysm, high flow fistulous connection. Whether a small or large size AVM bleed comparatively more is a matter which is still under evaluation. So this is an article by the Spatzer group and a wonderful commentary by the heroes group and they have concluded that the size could not be correlated with the risk of hemorrhage. Every DSA should be carefully evaluated for the presence of these risk factors. Radio surgery versus surgery for the deep feeders or the deep seated AVMs. There is no doubt that if there is a superficial small volume AVM situated in a low bar position it can be excised surgically, it should be excised surgically, but the same is not true for the deep seated AVMs. The biggest problem is with the deep seated AVM is presence of deep medullary feeders. These feeders are technically difficult. Their bleeding is difficult to control and their dissection leads to further white matter injury, which leads to the neurological damage and poor functional outcome. The importance of the deep feeders has been repeatedly highlighted in the literature. They are actually tiny vessels associated with some large vessels and their surgical dissection leads to significant neurological injuries. And even the leading surgical groups have recommended that gamma knife should be preferred over surgery in such cases. These deep feeders embolized to get embolized is also not a preferred option. Nothing has changed though. In the last whole century. As we can see that the Harvey Cushing told that it would not be nothing less than foolhardy to attack these deep-seated racemos lesions. The surgical history of most of the reported cases shows not only the futility of an operative attack upon one of these angiomas but the extreme risk of serious cortical damage which it entails. So we can see that actually despite getting better armamentarium, better imaging, the surgical results for the deep seated AVMs have not improved much. In cases of the deep locations, the gamma knife radio surgery should be given preference to the other treatment modalities. As you can see here, there are very tiny perforators arising from the anterior perforated substance and the anterior perforated substance from the A1 and the M1 territory and to embolize these perforators is going to lead to permanent neurological deficits. They are very safe and gamma knife is very effective in their management. The biggest argument against radio surgery for AVM is the possible risk of interval bleed till it gets completely obliterated. There are various studies which have evaluated this risk and it has been found that overall there is nearly 54% reduction in the interval bleed risk. So it can be found that during the latency period, the chance of rebleed is 2.3% per year for previously ruptured AVM and 1.1% for unruptured AVMs. And even if there is a bleed, usually it's a trivial bleed. In my own personal experience in last 10 years, I have found eight cases of rebleed in the interval period, out of which two patients needed surgery and one patient died. An AVM in an eloquent location such as this is another indication for gamma knife and should preferably not to be dealt with surgery or embolization in view of much better safety and complication profile of gamma knife radio surgery. Radio surgery and embolization. As far as management of AVM is concerned, the role of embolization is only as an adjunct to the surgery or radio surgery. Except for very small AVMs, embolization is rarely curative on its own. 
why do i personally remain against embolization is because of several reasons it really leads to complete embolization the nidus definition in a previously partially embolized avm becomes much more difficult there are high chances of recanalization it comes at a much higher cost and literature proves that post embolization results of the radio surgery leads to poorer results in comparison to the primary radio surgery i do consider their help whenever there is an associated aneurysm or a high flow fistula otherwise i prefer that a primary radio surgery should be done in these cases why do i remain against it i'll tell you in this way in large volume avm what i actually want is to have a sectorial embolization which can reduce the volume of avm so the part which couldn't be embolized should be treated with radio surgery but what i usually get is this this is a patchy embolization this patchy embolization does not decrease the volume but it increases the difficulty in the nidus definition the 3d volume of the nidi has not reduced i still have that same volume to be treated with the radio surgery so this is a rough patchwork intermittent embolization which has not helped but increased the chances of complication but if there is a high flow fistula i consider it the flow reduction without the avm volume reduction provides no benefit before radio surgery and it in fact makes radio surgery a difficult decision this patient you can see there is a huge avm and there was an early draining vein a very early draining vein which was suggestive of a fistulous connection that fistulous connection was embolized and later on the patient was treated with a single uh, with a dose fractionated radio surgery and after two years there was a complete obliteration of the nidus with no interval bleed or any other complication invariably it has been found that non embolized avm have a much better obliteration than previously embolized nidus and it has been found that actually combining endovascular approaches to the radio surgery are adding their respective complications rather than their individual therapeutic intents there have been multiple studies which have proven that embolic agents have radio protectant value which was higher with the nbca than the onyx so it dampens the radiation effect whenever there is radiation delivery presence of an embolic agent actually reduces the chances of effective delivery of the radiation though it is less with the onyx and we need to look in the long term studies with it when do i consider an um, uh, the help with my embolization whenever there is an aneurysm it is advisable to take care of that aneurysm because that aneurysm has a relatively high risk of bleeding it is necessary to know if the avm has ruptured or the aneurysm has ruptured if the aneurysm has ruptured it should be coiled while avm can be treated with gkrs as in this case there is a pica feeded aneurysm and a cerebellar avm the aneurysm had ruptured the patient had presented with a third ventricular bleed fourth ventricular bleed and the aneurysm was coiled while avm was successfully treated with gamma nephrite radio surgery it has already been proven in several studies earlier that if the expected avm obliteration rate after radio surgery is high there is no need for pre radio surgery embolization as the aneurysm is a flow related aneurysm the aneurysm will get collapsed in most of the cases with the obliteration of the nidus as these are the flow related aneurysm venous ectasia there is no definite consensus on its management However, gamma knife should be considered to be an effective treatment modality for these patients. Nidus vein junction is the most common site of any rupture. A venous ectasia suggests either it has a very high flow nidus or there is some fistulous connection inside the nidus. In such a case, always rule out the presence of a fistulous connection. Then it can be easily taken care of with the gamma knife radio surgery. A diffuse nidus is definitely a dilemma. because sometimes we confuse the nidus with a proliferative angiopathy and most of the times it becomes difficult to differentiate these two entities the confusion remains in exact nidus definition and a dsa is a must in these patients as there is significant amount of brain parenchyma 
among vascular channels it remains a difficult entity to be treated with any single treatment modality in any case radio surgery remains a better treatment modality than surgery or embolization There have been several radiosurgical series on the long-term outcome showing comparable safety and efficacy of radiosurgery in the management of low-grade AVM. The studies from since 2000 have a better long-term rate because of the improvement in the radiosurgical techniques, better imaging, and the better definition of NIDAS. Now come to the large volume and the complex AVMs. These are bigger problems any avm more than 10 cc in volume is considered to be a large volume while an avm can be complex on the basis of its size or volume the surgical definition of a complex avm is not same as the radio surgical definition of a complex avm so a small size avm in an eloquent or deep location would be considered complex while a large avm with superficial drainage can still be called a simple AVM. This fact has been beautifully pointed out by Spazra and the group. You can see here that there is a small AVM in the motor cortex. Though it is a small, but it is in an eloquent zone, so it is a complex AVM. And other are large volume AVM with the superficial or the deep drainage, but because of their size, they become complex. This table shows a very important message. For the group B, you need to treat these lesions, which is a heterogeneous group of the Spezza Martin grade 3, which needs to be treated with the multimodality treatment. Now, with the multifraction gamma knife also. The group 4 and 5 traditionally should be observed, but there are exceptions for the management, and you need to intervene if there are recurrent hemorrhages, progressive neurological deficits, still diluted phenomena and if there is an aneurysm which has ruptured. So whenever you have a large volume AVM, one should remember the key determinants of the outcome. And these determinants are the marginal dose and the size of the AVM. If it is more than 10 cc, either it can be dealt with the dose fractionation in which dose is reduced and given at staged intervals, or we can divide the volume of an AVM into small parts, usually two to three, and irradiate each part with the full dose radiation, keeping an interval of three to six months between these two fractions. Another option is multimodality treatment with surgery and embolization to downstage the volume of the AVM and treat the remaining part with the gamma knife radio surgery. And why do you need to do it? You need to remain safe. So when the largest dimension is three centimeter, there is a sharp dose fallout and you do not irradiate unnecessarily the rest of the brain. But if the same target increases in size, there might be a radiation is placed to the organs at risk, which you do not want for the better therapeutic outcome of the patient. So you downstays the tumor, the downstays the nidus, and either go with a dose or volume fractionation or with the multimodality treatment. There was little discomfort in the literature with the frame-based machines, the laxal perfection, but with the introduction of frameless radio surgery, more and more lesions are now being treated with the dose fractionation in different dosing and interval regimes. We have treated several patients in this manner and found some promising results. We keep the frame on the patient's head for the whole duration of the treatment, and we maintain an interval of 24 hours in between the two fractions. So this patient presented with this large volume AVM with prior history of bleed and seizures. He was treated with dose fractionation regime in three fractions. He received complete nidus obliteration. There was transient worsening in the form of radiation induced edema, which was controlled with the steroid and bevacizumab. We can appreciate that there are multiple deep feeders which are difficult to be tackled with surgery or embolization. Similarly, there is another patient with a posterior frontal AVM of 23 cc volume showing complete nidus obliteration after dose fractionated gamma knife with no interval bleed and other complication. This is a complex AVM treated last year with the nine grain three fraction dose fractionated gamma knife radiosurgery. And within one year, 
there is an impressive obliteration and we can see in the right internal carotid artery oblique view the maximum nidus is gone and only a small residue part is left behind we found that the cumulative radiation dose for the dose fractionated gamma knife should be in the range of 29 to 30 gray to obtain a good outcome with the acceptable complication profile so the dose fractionated gamma knife radio surgery is a feasible approach which was earlier performed with cyber knife in different dosing schedules usually in the form of five gray in five fractions we have practiced it with the more radiation in lesser fractions it can be done with the gamma knife keeping an interval of at least 24 hours in between the two fractions definitely there remains a risk of radiation induced edema but this is usually controllable with a short course of steroids with no permanent neurological deficit another option is the volume fractionation in which we divide the nidus into smaller volumes usually two volumes and there are several protocols it can be divided into two equal halves the nida can be separated on the basis of arterial supply it can be done from the deep group followed by the superficial group or from medial to the lateral or the division can be done on the basis of anatomical structures there is no consensus on the criteria to divide and the dosing schedule for them but one thing is sure when we divide the nida into two part we irradiate with the maximum possible volume keeping an interval of somewhere around three months to six months in between the two fractions the head-to-head -head comparison of dose versus volume fractionation has not been performed earlier there are some reports but it has been found that the volume fractionation is more efficacious but it also comes with a higher complication profile than dose fractionation hence long-term studies are actually needed for the same uh, this is from uh, the study from musa who did a literature review over it and we find that obliteration rate is nearly same but the hemorrhage risk is more with the volume fractionation gamma knife is equally effective in pediatric population there have been many concerns over radio surgery in pediatric patients such as sensitivity of the brain radiation induced neoplasia chances of delayed complications another argument was lesser efficacy than their adult counterparts and difficulty in the frame fixation this is a treatment plan and follow of dsa of an eight years old child whose avm showed complete nidus obliteration just after two years of gamma knife radio surgery and there have been long-term studies which have proven that radio surgery is as efficacious in pediatric patients as in their adult counterparts some studies have reported higher radiation induced changes at side effects but they are limited only as the hyper intensity on the perinidal t2 weighted scans which does not demand any surgical intervention and they didn't have any clinical deficit similarly gamma knife radio surgery or radio surgery is equally effective in elderly patients surgical series have reported worse outcome with elderly patients but good results in radiosurgical series a recent literature review in world neurosurgery attests to this finding with comparable radiation induced complication but no long term complication thus radiosurgery helps in improving the seizure control it still remains a controversial topic but overall there have been studies which show that srs improves the long term seizure control actually it is mostly related to the steel phenomena once the nida gets obliterated the chances of being medication free independent of the avm obliteration are there this part has to be further explored but definitely it helps in a better seizure control what should we do with the residual avm nidus any residual nidus can be treated with redo radio surgery after the latency period of three years we keep an interval of three years because the effect of radiation lasts for nearly three years and giving a radiation before that may lead to radiation induced complications usually such nidi are large in size if the nidus has shown reduction in the size after first radio surgery and this reduction is more than 50 percent there are high chances of good obliteration after second radio surgery too 
the dose can be on a higher side similar to the prior radio surgery with good prognosis and this has been proven in the literature that the obliteration rate remains impressive most of these AVMs were actually large volume AVMs and some were actually post embolization AVMs. Now, every treatment modality has its own set of complications. The morbidity and mortality profile of radio surgery is actually safer than surgery for complex and large volume AVMs. Radiation induced malignancy remains a controversial topic which has been made clear in the literature that the risk is not different from the general population. The other common complications in the long term are perinidal cyst formation, perinidal T2 hyperintensity or radiation induced edema, but they rarely demand any surgical intervention. Maximum of, maximum of these changes are actually radiological changes which do not demand any specific intervention. So this was a patient with a 40 cc left frontal AVM which has bled treated with gamma knife radio surgery post endovascular embolization and he had perinidal edema. The patient needed bevacizumab. There was a worsening right hemiparesis after radio surgery because he had a radiation induced edema, but it responded very beautifully to bevacizumab and patient has no further clinical deficit and the NIDI has shown an impressive obliteration. There is a very interesting phenomena of alopecia. Alopecia is a common phenomenon with conventional radiotherapy, but in gamma knife, we usually do not see alopecia. Temporary non cicatricial focal alopecia can be a complication, which is seen only with the focal superficial lesions, where dermal appendages are receiving three gray or more radiation. Invariably, I have found that this alopecia is temporary and the patients regain their same hair within three months of radiation. Now I am showing you some examples of simple and complex AVMs which have shown good results with radio surgery. So this is a 15 year old, 15 year old male presented with a paraventricular AVM with bleed, treated with a single fraction gamma knife radio surgery, and after two and a half years, there was a complete nidus obliteration. Another patient with a motor cortex AVM presented with bleed, and this is he was treated with a single fraction. This is mostly feeded by uh, the anticirculation and the patient had a complete nidus obliteration within 30, 30 months of common knife radio surgery. Another patient with a motor complex AVM, this is a very difficult surgical patient because the nidus is little diffuse, treated with a single session gamma knife radio surgery and post GKR is three years, there is a complete nidus obliteration. The literature evaluation of AVM classification schemes show multiple systems which kept evolving over the last century. Why do we need a classification system for any disease? The classification schemes are chosen to help in the management decision and predict the outcome and complications. One important discussion is to not use a spatula martin gate for the radio surgery outcome as a spatula martin gate is for the surgical outcome and the complications not for the radio surgery. There are separate radio surgery classification schemes. The earlier K index and obliteration prediction index actually predict the obliteration rate without predicting the complication profile. On the other hand, modified RBS score and Virginia radio surgery AVM scales, which have worked for all radio surgery systems, not only predict the obliteration, but also the complication profile. The modified polar flickinger scale is the most useful and practical one, which takes into account AVM volume, location, and patient's age into consideration. The simple score has proved to be a good predictive model for long term outcome in the various studies. So if we look in the long term studies and the comparative analysis, we can find that radio surgery is a very safe and effective treatment modality for AVM among various available cafeteria choices. There are various radio surgery platforms and the readers interested in their comparative safety and efficacy profile should read some articles and an important article by the G word. Because in radio surgery, the most important aspect is the sharp dose gradient and precision to remain safe with the minimum complication. So in the nutshell, to conclude, we can follow this algorithm, which is most pragmatic and reproducible. For a small volume AVM in low bar location, surgery remains the first treatment option if it can be performed safely, 
else radio surgery remains the best option and the safest option for any residual avm redo surgery or radio surgery is a feasible viable option for a small volume avm in deep anatomical locations the best option is radio surgery in view of its safety and better complication profile for larger volume in lobar locations the options are observation staged radio surgery or downstaging with the radio surgery apart from the technique the outcome is dependent on the proper patient selection and the planning and finally obliteration is just a part of the goal having an eye die getting completely obliterated boosts our ego and the confidence in the management and the technology but the other and important aspect is the functional outcome of the patient hence in patient decision making and follow up functional scales such as rankin should also get due importance in the last av management is very demanding and sometimes frustrating so be open for the multimodality approach with the wise decision in patient selection and its management thank you for your patient listening and uh, i would be ready to, i would be happy to answer any questions related to it thank you dr manjul dr manjul we have one question on the question on the question tab from uh, dr nishant would you like to answer that yeah uh, so dr nishant has asked do you decide dose fractionation based on total dose or biologic effective dose both the things are actually taken into consideration when we decide the dose fractionation the fractionation schemes actually the fractionation schemes are evolving when we consider the biologic effective dose we consider vascular malformation as a late responding tissue so alpha by beta of the 3 is taken in that conventionally it is taken alpha by beta ratio of the 3 so uh, the dose div division in the fractionation in two or three fractions or more than that fraction is dependent on the biologic effective dose the total dose is also taken into consideration if the volume is too high i remain slightly on a lower side with the 20 to 22 gray dividing into multiple fractions and if it is a, a small avm but in a eloquent location i try to divide the 25 gray which is the uppermost permissible limit in two or three fractions but the biologic effective doses usually remains the same uh, this has been uh, uh, the protocol for the same and the rational for the same i explained in my earlier publication in the neurologic india for the dose fractionation for the large volume apm thank you dr manjul if anybody else would have any questions please feel free to write it on the questions tab on the webinar control panel i'll open for another 2 minutes for any questions that might arise I see that Dr. Shweta Kedia has raised her hand for a query, but I don't see that query coming in. Ah, this is a very interesting question. Do you think the dose emission rate in the machine has any effect on outcome and obliteration rate? Ah, Nishant, this is a very interesting question, which has been actually being the answer to this has been actually being explored. for the trigeminal neuralgia by the regis group and uh, by ian padick and uh, with their chief physicist uh, dr uh, alexis dimitridis they have they are preparing a report on this because they have found that bed and the dose emission rate has a role in the effective radiation delivery i do not exactly have the answer for this question and i hope with the coming publication of uh, uh dr uh, regis and uh, ian padick we would be more knowledgeable about this concept this is a thing which is actually under evaluation at present ah uh, dr shweta has asked how often do you get to see brain edema 
brain edema i have seen in nearly around five to uh, in my own practice i have seen it in around five to eight percent of the patients and in 90 percent of these patients the brain edema is controlled with nearly a month of steroids but i have seen a few patients of intractable brain edema for whom i needed bevacizumab so uh, these patients which had brain edema they were actually complex avms large volume avms with uh, venous stenosis and deep seated avms in thalamus or the brain stem region i hardly saw any brain stem edema any edema in the perinatal area in a avm in a lobar location and how do you use bevacizumab i give a short course of steroid for nearly one month with a high dose and i evaluate the edema before uh, starting the steroid and on the follow up mri especially with the flare images if the patient shows a clinical improvement and the radiological improvement with it i gradually taper the steroid and stop it but if he fails to show an improvement after one month i start him on the bevacizumab for the bevacizumab the literature is very scant and I follow the protocol which was devised by Professor Kanchan Kumar Mukherjee that to start bevacizumab with 5 mg per kg body weight and repeat it after 2 weeks with 7.5 mg per kg to the maximum 10 mg per kg body weight. We give it for at least 6 cycles and after 6 cycles we repeat the radiology and then we compare the response in the edema. The endpoints of treatment are complete clinical and radiological improvement of the patient or if the response gets plateaued for continuous three cycles after six cycles of the bevacizumab we stop the treatment with the bevacizumab because it is a costly drug sometimes it has also its own set of complications and then according to the patient's functional and the neurological and the radiological status we have to decide the next plan of action To avoid alopecia, have you tried adjusting shorts? Uh, yes, I have tried adjusting shorts. And uh, alopecia in gamma knife radio surgery was not earlier explained in the literature in detail. With the conventional radiation treatment, we expose the scalp to the five gray of radiation. The five gray radiation actually leads to a permanent injury to the dermal appendages, and that leads to a permanent alopecia. I evaluated these patients in retrospect and when I found when I re-evaluated their plans I found that actually the scalp was and the dermal appendages were getting three grade radiation exposure so all these patients started loosening their hair in a typical gamma knife pattern like with a sharp dose fallout so if you if I can go back to my uh, screen where i have shown the alopecia so this patient was having a superficial avm and the alopecia was just over that area so these the patients invariably regain the same quality of the hair with the same texture and the same color without any inflammation or injury to the scalp and i found that actually it is the three gray so now now whenever i try to, i plan a superficial lesion I try to avoid the radiation spillage of more than three gray to the dermal appendages. Uh, how does volume fractionation influences rather increases the bleeding rate for an AVM? Is the risk benefit favorable? How does volume fractionation influence? The volume fractionation we treat one volume one part of the volume of an abm leaving the another part of the volume of the abm most of the times we decide on our radiology which part has actually bled and the part which has bled is treated first probably when we do a volume fractionation with the gradual obliteration of a part of the nidus the ngo architecture changes and when this changes it may open a few channels which were earlier closed because one part of the nidus is, is still open it has not received any treatment and a selective flow and an altered flow of the blood in that area might increase the chance of the bleeding in that case as far as the risk benefit ratio is concerned actually this 
is very debatable between dose fractionation and the volume fractionation and the selected series published so far because in the world the people are more in more practicing volume fractionation than the dose fractionation especially before the introduction of icon we have long term series with the volume fractionation and very less series with the dose fractionation for the large volume avia the risk benefit ratio is definitely better because the radiation induced complications are more manageable than the risk of the bleeding and neurological deficits another question have you ever encountered a case with which required surgical intervention for radio surgery induced edema uh, yes I, I i encountered a case but this case was a parasagittal meningioma in which case there was an intractable edema the patient did not respond even to continuous six cycles and there was a progressive worsening so the patient needed a surgical decompression in that case but with the avm luckily i have not encountered any avm or any edema which needed a surgical intervention later on any failure of bevacizumab i think i have answered this question um, yes uh, one patient needed a surgical intervention the problem with bevacizumab is that in the resource stricken countries uh, it's a costly drug and people mostly do not find themselves able to continue the treatment so sometimes we need to stop the bevacizumab for the radiation induced edema the other treatment modalities are high dose of vitamin e and uh, pentoxifilin which has been advocated by the pittsburgh group i personally have not used that one but the literature shows that that's an alternative treatment modality if you fail on the conventional treatment how many rebleeds have you witnessed in your patients uh, dr shweta i have witnessed eight rebleeds but most of these rebleeds means out of eight six were just managed with an observation no further intervention was needed they were interval bleed one patient actually died because he had a severe bleed and uh, when i received the patient the patient had already expired and in another patient i needed to give radiation again because though the nidus got completely obliterated there was an early draining vein which was showing that some channel was still there and i treated that uh, part with a surgical intervention uh, if that is all I would be okay. happy to answer if there is any other question and I hope I have answered your queries satisfactorily. Well, with that, we come to the end of this webinar. Thank you for being with us this evening. Wish you a great weekend ahead. Thank you for joining. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Dr. Manju. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.